Hello, everyone. This is Andreas, Pop Culture Guy. Me, well, Chris and I are back again for another spectacular Andreas Pop Culture Talk. And of course, today we're discussing Barbie Hammer. That's right, Barbie slash Opera Hammer. Uh, we <laughs> seen these films, finally. We finally saw Barbie. Uh, we saw Am Opera Hammer first, a uh, long time ago in July. So, but no worries. I mean, it's a pretty awesome movie. I think we can remember some parts. <laughs> so, but yeah. Uh, Chris, how you doing? How was your day? Good. I'm doing all right. My day was great. You know, thanks to the uh, thanks to the Lord, and you know, you know the news that um I officially yeah. got hired to as a crew member for AMC Theaters. Um, yeah. This is definitely, um, like I said, I'm definitely nervous because it's definitely going to be a new experience for me and experience for me and i know that i'll have to adjust to certain things that i may not be comfortable with so i know that you know i'll have to really step out of my uh, comfort zone with this job because it does carry a lot of responsibility and task so but you know i'm confident that things are going to work out because i know the lord has back and regardless everything is done according to his will so I'll be okay, regardless of whether things pan out or not. I'll be fine. Yes, sir. Yes, same same here. So, yeah. So, very excited that you got a job, finally. That's good. I like this in the theater. That's good. I mean, as uh, Tristan, I think, brought up in the chat, uh, like, uh, I think two days ago, um, that you're going to get free movies if you work. Yes. You know, so. That's, you that's one of the benefits. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, that's good. Um, but yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm like so speechless. I'm very happy, <laughs> you know, because, you know, we're, well, folks, yeah, don't know, me and Chris have been, yeah, doing job search, uh, you know, especially for me after I, I was done with my college. Uh, Chris, how long have you been done with your college? Like, I think last year or something? Yes, like that? yes. I graduated May of last year with, um, and I got my bachelor's degree in communication. Okay. I had I had voluntarily left uh, Chick Fil A before I had graduated because you know unfortunately I dealt with a situation where a coworker was harassing me. I reported him and I made it clear to my then managers that I didn't want to work with him anymore. But unfortunately, they still scheduled me with him and he continued to harass me. So I was like, "This isn't worth my mental health." So I left. Yeah, good, good, good job. Uh, leaving, uh, I don't understand why they did that. So, but at this point, it's you know, it's been a year, so it's over now. So, really good. That's right. And, it's over now. Yes, exactly. So, um, so you know, we, we you know, today we're gonna discuss two movies. Uh, how you want to start, Chris? You want to start with Barbie or Oppenheimer? Where you want to go, buddy? Let's start with Oppenheimer first. Okay. Okay, that's fine. So we'll go with Hopper Hammer. Uh, so this is uh, the new Christopher Nolan movie, uh, of course, starring Killian Murphy, uh, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Florence Pugh, Josh Hartman, and uh, Kenneth Branagh are in the film. And this is Christopher Nolan's, uh, I think, 12th uh, cinematic uh, film in his uh, film mockery. And uh, this was. His last movie was Tenet, which me and Chris uh, actually seen in three years, like, oh my god, three years ago, I think, right? <laughs> like, three years during the pandemic. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, we, we saw it, and uh, really, we chose this uh, as a uh, first movie, and, and the week of Barbara Hammer was open with Barbie and Upper Hammer releasing the same day. We chose to watch Upper Hammer on Sunday. So, Chris... What's your overall thoughts on the film? I, I mean, it, it should be no surprise. We all like the film, so. What oh, absolutely! Your on the film? I mean, definitely uh, had to build a lot of uh, endurance. It's def it definitely was long. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And but you know what really, what I really liked was the sound effects of the film because you know whenever when it came to like. When it came to like you know the bomb the bombs explode the bombs exploding, you know you can just you can just feel you can just really feel the sound and it's like it's like you you were actually there watching that bomb explode and 
and your ears, yeah. well, your ears jump, jumping out of your, jumping off your head. So I really love the sound effects and Killian Murphy. You know, you know, words can't describe his. You know how he bodied this his performance and how he really embodied the the character. You know, who was a who was a real who was a real person. Um, yeah, definitely didn't didn't see those uh, sex scenes coming. It was pretty uh, raw with like the nudity and stuff. So that was kind of like, whoa, whoa, okay, that's kind of strange. But overall, you know, the movie was good. I enjoyed myself, and it was definitely you know worth its three hours. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, <laughs> thank you for bringing up the the sex scenes. <laughs> Because I think you had a good reaction while we were watching it. And we were oh, watching the, crowd, the crowd did. They were, you know, you can you can tell like they were surprised. They were surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, it's just very unusual for Christopher Nolan to do that. Like his films, I mean, he has done rare art films, but like even the rare art films he's done previously are not like that graphic that like you saw in this film. But hey. I mean, he, he did something new, so it was, like, very impressive, and uh, it, it at least wasn't gratuitous, like, some sex scenes, if you, we would see them in years. I, I think this was very textually, and you kind of understand the context of it, you know? So, uh, but that's pretty good. Um, I agree with you, Chris. I, I will say this is, uh, like, like, overall, this was Nolan's best film. If you check out my Instagram, I did post on my top ten favorite you know, Christopher Nolan films, and this was my third favorite after uh, Dark Knight and Inception. I think this is his mm -hmm. best film since those movies. I mean, like everything about it is just just great. Like, like everything has came together so effectively. Like the sound design is actually the best since I think Inception, because <laughs> Nolan has been having trouble with his sound design mm -hmm. for some reason. Uh, like, like Tenant, like. Uh, the last movie you and I saw in theaters um, was like it had really mixed uh, sound designs that would, like it was hard for us to understand what was going on with our characters talking. So mm -hmm. I, you know, so I, I think that was one of the issues with that. Um, and then uh, the performances, like I mean, I was so happy that Kelly Murphy was a lead in this film. Like he's been working with Nolan since Batman Begins, and so I was very happy he got a chance to be a lead on a Nolan film, and it did not disappoint, which I was very happy. And the ensemble cast was great. Like I love Emily Blunt in this film. I love Matt Damon. He was great. I mean, he had really great funny lines. I loved <laughs> the part when one of the scientists wanted to leave and then say, "What are you going to do?" Yeah, you know, with the, the clearance and all that, he said he's gonna kill him. <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, if you understand what was going on with that scene and the whole, you know, fear uh, of the communists finding out the, the Manhattan Project and all that. Um, anyway, and then of course, Robert Downey Jr. and like in his supporting role was like really good. One of his best performances since, since oh my god, since Tropic Thunder. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I really liked it. It's, it's one of my favorite films of 2023, of this year. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was just very shocked with, like, how good it was. And I'm so happy it's performing well in the box office. It, it just recently uh, overtaken Guardians 3 to be the third highest of this year in terms of worldwide. So, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, well, that's not that's not uh, surprising to hear at all. I mean, it definitely had a bit of its funny moments, and was and it was nice to see uh, Robert Downey Jr. You know, you know, performing yeah. as you know, with with uh, you know post you know Iron Man and seeing him as pretty much you know a bad guy technically. Uh, that was definitely interesting to see and. You know, of course, uh, I know with three a three-hour film, you know, I know it's easy to get bored, but I think that the storyline and the sound effects were compelling enough that you didn't get bored. You were still inv so invested in the scene, and that movie had you on, on your feet, and I love the, whoever the composer was, you know, did a great job of setting the tone with each scene with this music, because you notice as each scene got intense, the music got intense. The pacing of the music got got faster, and you know you can just 
you can just feel your heart rushing with adrenaline. Um, so definitely the sound system and, you know, this, I mean, sorry, the sound effects and the music, you know, really did a good job of taking us of where we are, where we are in the movie and setting the tone. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, so, so you're speaking of the, the music, uh, the, the composer was, uh, Lod uh Ludwig Gershon. Um, he was the composer Ludwig, that did. Ludwig who? Uh, uh, Liquid um, Garrison, the, mm -hmm. the Swedish composer that did the two Black Panther films, and right. uh, he he's the one that did Tenet. He took over for Hans Zimmer. So mm -hmm. yes. So uh, what else he did that I could see? Uh, <laughs> see what he did uh, here. Filmography. So he did like oh wow he did he did a couple of of. Uh, uh, Ryan Kruger's films like Food Station and Creed. Uh, he did Top Five, the Chris Rock film. Uh, he did Central Intelligence. Uh, and I mentioned, yeah. Uh, oh, he did Venom, the first one. Um, he did the, the two Black Panther movies. And yeah, and this is the second collaboration for Nolan for him because uh, he did Tenet. So yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed the music here than Tenet, I would say, because it was a little more. Uh, excited to hear so you know um but, but yeah 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 that that's where we're at with the composer um but anyway um i guess the, the, the big question is like do you know opera Hammer, like as, as a person because that was the thing like i was i i knew about the manhattan project and like if if you've been like if you know about your world war ii stories like you know that mm -hmm. the manhattan project is a thing that created the uh the h-bombs that attacked right. um Nagasaki and other the Japan territories during mm -hmm. World War II. Um, do you know about this person, um, J. J. Robert Oppenheimer? No, I did not know who he was until I saw this movie. Um, mm -hmm. From okay. what, from what you know, the movie told told us is that uh, you know he he was seems like he was a little bit of a womanizer and a showman. Uh, he definitely looks like his private life was a you know disa disaster you can tell that he was definitely a smoker and yeah. you know obviously you learned about um his uh jew his uh jewish heritage and how definitely world war ii you know affected him as well as as well as you know millions of people throughout the world especially the countries involved in you know that deadly war yeah, uh, but no, you know, it wasn't until I saw this movie. Um, you know, you know, I didn't know J. Robert Oppenheimer. I didn't even know he existed until I saw this film. So this was a great uh, history lesson for me, and especially as a person that loves history. Yeah, that's true. Um, same here. Uh, I think this was like the first time seeing this character uh, depicted. I, I, I think. <laughs> I, I kind of remember like what else that like I, I saw some media that they depict him. I I think I, I yeah I, I think this movie is one of the best like biopics that that for someone like a single in, individual from history. Like I think they did a good job of like just digging in his life, his philosophy, you know, his way of thinking, and like how important he was creating this like bomb for the government. And like how like questioning the impact of creating this like huge powerful weapon that will affect the the course of human history or human life, right? And mm -hmm. I, I think the, that this movie uh, by Nolan did a really good job of addressing that in a very really, uh, like really intellectual way. And uh, and I, I really appreciate that because we don't discuss that in in, in like. And plus, I, I, I think they did a good job of, like, being honest uh, who this person was. Like, he wasn't perfect. So, I, I really like that they dug in with his affairs and all that. Like, you know, it's kind of neat, you know? Because they, they, that movie can easily, like, 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 swept away with the, you know, the whole, press for, uh, the, the whole uh, communist affair he had or the, you know, the, the mistress that he was having. Uh, while doing this project, you know, but I was, you know, I was happy that they they dealt with that. You know. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Of course. Um, you know, no, you know, no one, no one is perfect. No one is perfect. You know, we, we, yeah. we, all, we all know that, but, um, and I'm glad that the film, you know, did not shy away, did not shy away from, you know, his personal life and, you know, his own vices that he had himself. Um, yeah. I wish Florence Pugh got more screen time, though. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. I was, I, I mean, first of all, I was shocked that, yeah, she was there. I mean, I saw mm -hmm. the trailer, she was there. I, I didn't know what kind of role she was going to have. Like, seeing a villain, you understand what that is. Um, I mean, Florence Pugh is a great actress. I, I think she would, like, what was great about Nolan, he, you know, every film he has, there's, like, actors that have this one moment, and they're good, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it, Tenet? Like, Michael Caine was in Tenet, and that was a good scene. And, like, he, he's barely in the film. Or, like, um, I'm trying to figure out who else, like, uh, uh, Luger Hauer uh, from the Blade Water movie actor uh, in Batman Against. He's barely in that film, but, like, he's really good at that. as this, like, shady businessman that wants to control white enterprise. Or... Mm -hmm. You know, or, or like Danny, uh, David Bowie for The Prestige. He plays uh, Nikola Tesla in that film. And he's barely in that film, but like he's really good at that. So that's the that's the, the, decimate, uh, the testament of Nolan as a director. Just, you know, giving the actors a lot of leeway, but also direct them very well to have the performance to impact the really the emotions right away, you know? And I think Fairness Blue nails that very well in this film no matter the screen time so i i, I think it really works i like the detail that maybe it was one of the governments that kill her like like we discussed there was like briefly a scene where a glove was like in the scene briefly and that was like very funny and like oh like it's kind of conspiracy thinking that maybe the government kind of quieted down you know, she probably leaked some stains for the mana pressure or whatever. So I mm -hmm. think all that really works. I all right, so I, I think I am happy what we did with Florence Pooh here in the film. Um, you know, because there's other characters we have to deal with, you know. Right, right. Um, it, I you know, know the, I, yeah. the casting was uh, top tier. You know, you had Down Robert Downey Jr. You had that actor from who played uh, the young young Han Solo. Um, you know, yeah. you had Flor you know, yeah. Florence Pugh, Pugh, you had Matt Damon, uh, Kenneth Bar Barna. It, it was definitely like a wider range of, you know, vet of uh, veteran actors. Yeah. Um, but like each, yeah. each character got your moment to shine, which is hard to do when you have, you know, cat when you cast so many top tier actors. Yeah, it's true. Um, I mean, it's always like, precise and delicate that you have to do with with those actors and like what you have to do to make the performance hit right away and like you can understand what's going on and like mm -hmm. like like appreciate what they're doing and that's something that's hard sometimes and uh you know with nolan i think he he has definitely nailed that very well so mm -hmm. which is good um uh, I guess we, we, let's get into, like, uh, aspect of the film, like, uh, well, what do you think about the humor that they displayed this? I, I think it was Nolan's best, uh, use of humor in the film. I thought everything yeah. landed right away to laugh, like, towards the end, that when you brought up the Han Solo actor, uh, Bernard, uh, Ehrenreich or something like that, that's the name of the, the Han Solo actor, he lists down the people that pulled it uh, voted down Robert Downey Jr.'s character, and he said J.F. Kennedy, and people, like, our audience laughed very hard when J.F. Kennedy was brought up. <laughs> I, I thought that one was really well, like, like, they, humor. They, they kept the humor, the humor at a at a minimum, and yes. because, like, it didn't take away to, it didn't take away from you know, the point, you know, the main theme and the main point of the film, so I think they did a nice job of balancing of knowing when to hit the humor at the right times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, especially like the the apple that he was trying to poison his professor. Right, right. Like, 
very tense, but also funny. Like when he, he had to grab it from his favorite IO scientist that was played by Kenneth Branagh. So that was really cool. <laughs> Yeah, and you heard uh, in the movie, I noticed, you know, there was a lot of, like, references to, like, com you know, like, communism and fascism and, um, and those two, uh, ide those two, uh, ideologies are, you know, pretty, are, you know, those two ideologies still exist, to still exist today, so I like how Christopher Nolan, um, really addressed the impact of those two political ideologies in the film. Yeah, so let's talk about that. I, I'm very surprised that he was like into the communist beliefs. I mean, I, oh, who, I, I mean yeah, like I was, I was very shocked about that. And I, I was just, I mean, he was never like, well, how would say, like, he was into it, like, he, 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 he agreed with the beliefs, but like, he never went forward into like like into the communist community you know like several of the characters we saw like Franz Pooh's character was like mm -hmm. in the communist right of, you know and, and i'm kind of like fascinated why the apple Hammer didn't join but at the same time he, he was like i mean it was like in between or like it was like during when world war ii was starting to pick up so like i don't know like i i just it's very interesting he didn't join like the party full on, but at the same time, like what happens? Like, like if you're full on correct, like communist, you gotta be arrested, right? Like, every in time, right? Because like, yeah, communist party was kind of scary. Like, I mean, like, with, like the Russia versus U.S. is still like going. You know, it's like we still not trust them for some reason. But, <laughs> so oh, yeah, I, I have. Um, I don't know too much about these ideologies. Well, do like do you know what um what communism fascism is directly? Uh, like fas like fascists, I know a little bit more than communists. Right. You, you, can can you like explain more to communists for like the audience and for me? Because I, I I personally haven't really got that much stuff. All right. Well, yeah. Actually, okay. So just to give me a second. Yeah. So communism is a political ideology and type of government where the state owns the major resources in a society. The goal of ah. yes, the goal of communism is to create a classless society where everyone shares the benefits of labor. In a communist society, the state controls all property and wealth. The state also owns the means of production, education, agriculture, and transportation. So it's basically a, a left wing to far left socio political, philosophical, and economic ideology within the socialist movement. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Because uh, with fashion, it, it, well, with fashions, it's more of a like a, a authoritarian uh, yeah. society, like like mm -hmm. you know, like holding a grasp on the people. And, and like brainwashing them into believing this like cause that it's not true and yeah like, and the, right. you know, suppress them you know yeah basically yeah because um fascism it emphasizes far-right nationalism and the supremacy of the nation and a single leader over the individual citizen so fascists believe that the state takes precedence over individual interests so they oppose yeah. marxism liberalism and democracy yeah that's true. That's true. Um, which I think, like, I think it's like Japan sort of is that, right? Like, in terms of their culture a little bit. Like, they, they display it differently. But, like, it, right. you can view, view Japan, like, a little bit like fashion, the way they handle their, like, people and then the, the way of, you know, working in their government uh, way, you know? Um, that, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know too much about communists, but that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it makes sense for Opera Hammer. I think because I, I think I I agree on one part, having a government control resources, but I don't like the idea of the government controlling like other things that that's not really theirs, you know? Right. I mean, so, you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to have, because, you know, everyone, 
unfortunately, yeah, not everyone is treated equally and fairly. But you know, you definitely don't want the government to have a uh, full control of your full control of uh, your life and your individual rights, because you know, bad things can bad things happen when you know the state has um, total control over the rights of its citizens. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, very scary. Um, but I'm happy for this person not joining the uh, the communists. I think it could have been weird, but anyway. Um, but I did laugh very hard like how like i i, I don't know like, like it, it, it was just very funny that the government allowed Abraham hammer to like like for him to break protocols to like leave the base and like that could have been more suspicious to him and then at the same time he did the other thing where he lied about where he was going uh, to you know where he was going to meet uh Florence Pugh's character like it was a lot of risk. Yes, Florence Pugh's character was Gene uh, Tattlelock, and mm -hmm. he and we all know he was Oppenheimer's lover before and during his marriage to Kitty, to his wife Kitty, who was played by Emily Blunt. Yeah. Um, what, did, what did you um, did you did you like um, Gene Tattlelock? How did you like uh, Pugh's uh, performance with this character? I I I liked it as I grew up. I thought I you know I I brought brought up that I think the screen time she has was great. It was enough to really convey what was going on. I thought Florence would bring, really bring that character to life. Because like, I, I read I think afterwards from the film that she was a troubled person. I, you know, she was a very complex character that... Um, hey, was you know, a real person? Yeah, well, a lot of these characters were real. Like, uh, Louis, um, so like Robert Downey's character, uh, Louis Dowers, is real. He was right. like, you know, part of that, mm -hmm. you know, thing. Uh, so Gene Tuckwick was a real character, was part of the commu uh, Communist Party, um, mm -hmm. uh, which was banned apparently in the 1950s, of course, because of the, the McCarthy thing. Um, unfortunately, she suffered a lot of clinical depression, so that's why she committed suicide, as we saw in the film. Um, I, I, I think I. I think I'm seeing, uh, yeah, like, I think, so, like, in the film, there is, like, conspiracy that it could have been an assassin, uh, assassination as well, but it's mm -hmm. very much, like, a vague theme in uh, the real life uh, talk about this character, or about this person, not character, but this person, in real life, that's associated with upper armor. In the film, I liked how they, they actually addressed that, that, like, she did commit suicide, but also pull out this theory that's been discussed that she could be assassinated by maybe the U.S. or something like that. Um, and, and you brought up um, Emily Blunt's character, Kitty. Like, let's bring up the wife. Like, I really like Emily Blunt. She's a great actress. No, oh, um, absolutely. I thought, yeah, like, like I, I thought she was amazing. I think everything what she did was a great character that, you know, was, you know, as, as you've seen with a wife type of character. I think she really conveyed that. I think she had great chemistry with Kelly Murphy as, as the, the duo. Um, but yeah, uh, my favorite scene from her was when she kind of like had to shake off a Palmer's like sadness of what happened to Gene's uh, death. And like he had to like get it over and, and, and help these people to make this happen with the, 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 the bomb. Thing. So I like that scene um, when uh, she has to find him. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Ellie Blunt was really great as well. Like, we should not forget about her. She was a great character here, uh, actress. So, um, oh, uh, wait, wait, yeah. Talk about? oh, yeah, uh, uh, ab abs abs absolutely. Um, you do you definitely, um, and of course, you know, uh, would you? She definitely was um, pivotal in uh, Oppenheimer's life and uh, who he was. But, um, you know, obviously, obviously, you know, it wasn't going to work because, you know, they I wouldn't say they were lovers. They were just two people that just got together for, for sex. You know, that's all it was. It wasn't anything more. It wasn't anything more than that. And, and I don't think Oppenheimer was even in love with her in the first place. No, no. 
uh, I don't think so either. I mean, it, like, he already had a wife and a kid, so, like, it was, it was more like, uh, you know, taking out the pressure uh, that he was dealing with current, you know, with the, the, the Manhattan Project. So, you know, it makes sense. And, you know, it, it happens in real life, you know, so, sense, you know. Um, and then, uh, well, and then also, like, we talked, uh, I brought briefly Robert Downey Jr., his character, uh, Louis Davis. So he's a real person. And he was really mm -hmm. against uh, Upper Harbor as a character. Uh, we thought about uh, oh. Robert Downey Jr.'s performance here and all that. Well, clearly he had a ven he had a vendetta against them because you know, uh, you know they just couldn't they just you know couldn't agree they just couldn't agree and you know Robert Downey Jr.'s character is you, you know he made it his uh, mission to uh, take o Oppenheimer down and you know throughout f the film it looked like it it worked but uh, you know at the end yeah he got he got caught. And you know his ego yes. got the best. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I was like, I was like very surprised by one of the scientists that was put by Remy Malik to like spit out that this is all his doing, and that was like such a great burn. And then I, I like towards the end of the film that you know he got voted down by five people, including our I guess future president, right, or, or like our current president John F. Kennedy, to like just be built develop him from what he was doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it was pretty cool. Um, okay, let me, uh, so, like, uh, any more you want to discuss with other characters? Um, like, I guess briefly, Matt Damon, like, that, uh, Matt Damon was great in this film. Um, I think that was a great, like, undistracted, uh, duo. I was expecting him and Kelly Murphy were great together. Uh, he, he had the mm -hmm. best funny lines, which I liked. So I, I thought he was really good. Uh, but any, uh, any thoughts on Matt Damon as uh, general? Uh, I, I think I know his character from uh, just give me a minute. Uh, oh no, Damon, I thought uh, general. I, yeah, I, I I liked I liked his uh, performance too, and you know, it definitely he had a lot on his shoulders. So it always, it seems like he was always on. On edge, you know, you know, and I just liked the relationship between uh, Oppenheimer oh. and uh, Matt Damon's character, and Matt Damon's yeah. character. And yeah, I like you know, right. we said, you know, if we push that button, is there a chance that like we can basically, you know, destroy the whole world? And I, I think that really speaks to you know how lethal and how powerful this bomb really was, because it, it yeah, you know, you know. The fact that, you know, we even have the capability as humans to build, you know, such a, such a weapon like that, that could literally destroy, that could literally destroy the planet. It's just, you know, I think one thing this film showed is that, you know, humans are capable of anything. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I agree. And then, plus, just, you know, him believing Papa Hummer being the right guy uh was kind of cool i mean so it's pretty cool oh and other thing uh i guess the big elephant in the room einstein uh let's bring up that person because i the actor who played einstein i was like he got a really good actor playing einstein yeah and i mean he i did job with the apparent with his like physical appearance is like you know he definitely resembled einstein a lot yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that people like Einstein. Like he, I mean, I have all the scientists in the world. Like everyone recognizes Einstein. Um, one thing I, what well, so everyone knows this character's name. Uh, the actor that plays Einstein is called Tom Conti, and he is actually the actor that was in Dark Knight Rises that helps Bruce Wayne during the pit that helps him like fix his back apparently <laughs> uh during really yeah, Bruce Wayne's oh, I, gotta, I gotta watch it again because i didn't notice yeah it's that guy i i know you say you you saw uh or, like recently dark knight rises uh but that, that's the guy that plays einstein if if, if you've seen the the pit scenes it, the guy that talks to um bruce and like he's the one that helps um 
takes us back is, is that person that plays Einstein. Oh, wow, that's, that that's him. Oh yeah, wow, that was him. Wow. I did. I did not. I did not. I did not notice that at all. Yeah, I mean, he looks just. I mean, like in writing, like he has white hair. Uh, he doesn't have a mustache like in this film, where he, he's supposed to have that because that's Einstein. <laughs> so I am very impressed that, like, he looked like Einstein. So and that's very impressive. Oh, absolutely, so absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So they. They took time in making sure that he resembles, you know, Einstein. Because if he didn't, if he didn't even come close to resembling him, you know, he would have caught caught a lot of criticism from fans. And I think that speaks to the genius and the work of uh, Christopher Nolan. And you know, I'm not surprised that the film did did you know perform the way it did. Um, you know, you give yeah. you you hand Nolan a film. You know, with themes that Oppenheimer has, you know it's going to do well because he's done it before. I mean, you know, and I think it's because of Nolan in a way that he really got, you know, the MCU and the DCU started because of his masterful cinematic movies with um, Batman, The Dark Knight, and that trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah well, that too, but also, yeah, I, I mean... It took a good director. I think that's the the big thing with Nolan. I like the most. Um, I I always wonder. Uh, so so like, you know. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about this film. Um, oh, uh, you know, briefly, like uh, Gary Oldman as the president, uh, Harry as Truman. Uh, that was funny. I I was so happy that Nolan brought that. Was so surprising. I did not expect that. No, I I, I try to remember. Like, yeah, I knew. I, I, yeah, like something was. Uh, like, I was just shocked to see Gary Oldman as in this movie and as as the president uh, during that time. Uh, that was really great, and he definitely nailed the character, the, the president uh, Truman uh, personality yep. and all that. It was funny. He's like, they were, like, they were bringing this. Yeah, <laughs> I I loved the the end of the scenes. Like they were bringing this weak. Uh, was it? P person, P person. <laughs> and, 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 and and his office again. <laughs> oh my god, it was just very funny. He did a good uh, job yeah, with this, I, his uh, southern his um accent, like some southern accent though. Oh yes, that's very true. Um, yeah, that's that's always the tough thing but when you're dealing with southern people. Uh, I, Gary Oldman, I, I think Gary Oldman had played a couple of those. So like he's very like natural with that. Um but Gary Moss good when he, he goes into character very well. Like I don't know if you've seen Darkest Hour. He played Churchill. Uh that, that was the movie that got his Oscar, his first Oscar. Uh, it's really good. Uh he definitely Churchill there. Um anyway, so let's like wrap up Alpha Hammer so we can get into Barbie. I, I wanna give you some facts, uh if you don't mind. Uh so Let's I wanna do, do is the fictions. Yeah, like, like, so some of the things are not true in the film. So apparently, this is fiction. People didn't know it's an explosion in the middle of the Thursday. So apparently, in this article, checking and say that Oppenheimer doesn't zoom out beyond the scientists and military members who watched the Trinity test that we see, where they test the first bomb. Uh, so apparently, they say the brightness of the flame and the sound of the explosion and the shaking caused by the last wave didn't go unnoticed. But it I say that it, the force blew out windows nearby cities in Texas uh, residents. So they, they could see the flash from over 280 miles away. So that's the thing. And uh, yeah, and, and it was recorded in the newspaper. So that was it. Oh, uh, another fiction. They say they knew the bomb was going to end the world. And the war, sorry, <laughs> not the world. <laughs> My bad. That that sounded like an alien taking over the, the earth. <laughs> I am an alien. I will drop a bomb and end the world. Anyway, my bad. My bad, guys. Uh, so apparently, this was fiction. In the movie, they make it seem the reason they're using the bot is because they want to invade. They don't want to invade Japan. Now, this is not true. Like we did invade Japan. Yeah. During World War II, if I yeah, I remember correctly, right? 
and it's just not actually discussed at the time. But apparently this was like a fact rational that was created later. Uh, and apparently in the in December of 1946, in the article, it apparently said dropping bomb was a calculated gamble that Secretary of War statements and others hoped it could end the war. But it was not true. Because we ended the war around 1948, right? That was when World War II was over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Okay, uh, let's see. Um, let's look at something more interesting. Uh, oh, here we go. This one's interesting. So, fiction, this one's fiction. Oppenheimer was silent because he was thinking about the long term implications of nuclear weapons. Now, uh, so it apparently says that the main character was a bit a lone wolf, the only one in meetings with Groves and Stimmons, these war generals, asking the questions about the long term implications from the nuclear weapons as we see in the film but it's sort of different because in some sort of uh, French precision that only Oppenheimer had he definitely played a role in African it in real life, real life. so so it was uh, so like other people had the same idea and lots of people took it really seriously as high, highest levels of government were thinking about that so it wasn't only Oppenheimer you know it was everyone else that was thinking about that uh, and this includes Stemmons, who brought these concerns to the, the president, but it seems like the president didn't care, as we've seen. No. Uh, oh, this is fiction. Oppenheimer consulting Einstein about the Taylor's calculations of the hydrogen bomb. So apparently this was not true. So, okay. uh, so apparently it wasn't, uh, it wasn't Einstein who Oppenheimer went to. It, uh, it was... Okay, so instead it went to, um, instead I remember consulted this person, Comp uh, Compton, so I think is, let me check, I think I did see this character in the film, uh, just give me a minute, oh, yeah, or, I think he's not in the film, don't think, uh, I haven't seen the film, so yeah, so, the, uh, uh, okay. uh, no, so this person was not in the film, so this was fiction. Uh, okay, so next fiction was Upper Harbor re, uh, re, re, uh, was it? remade anti H bomb. That was not true, apparently. There were a few reasons why Upper Harbor was hesitant about the H bomb, including there were limit, limited resources for weapons development after the war. That's true. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't want to make don't want to make weapons, but like making more weapons already have, not waste material on the weapons that that might not work. So that, so and apparently he was like in favor again, and sort of. Okay. So yeah, so it was not true. Um, oh, fiction. The secretary for Oppenheimer that we saw in the like the the base was fake apparently. So like that wasn't true. Uh, yeah, it's like he's so that secretary was briefly uh, as a secretary for Upper Armor, but then it went definitely. So, and that's it. So, that's my fiction of this Upper Armor thing. So, just like bring that up. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, I, I guess I, I, I'm trying to figure out what are things that are it. Um, well, anything else to say, Upper Armor? Uh, Chris, I, I think. I, is there anything else to say besides when you know get ready to talk about Barbie a little bit? But uh, uh, what's your overall thoughts of the film? And uh, you're uh, you have you seen the film a second time? No, I've only I only saw it once with you. Um, like I said, it was a good film, and um, you know it was a great uh, history. It was a great history lesson for me, and definitely I'll start doing my own investigation into Oppenheimer and, you know, World War II and, you know, how, it, how um, you know, that period in, hist in history affects us today still. But I'm ready to uh, move on to Barbie. Yep. All right. Well, folks, uh, I hope you enjoyed this segment of Opera Hummer for the Barbie Hummer podcast. So now we're going to Barbie, the 2023 film that stars Margaret Robbie, Ryan Gosling, uh, America, America Troy, 
and then Isaac, uh, Ray, and then Rhea Coleman, uh, and then we got Will Fella in the film, and so many more classic actors, uh, including Samuel Liu. And anyway, uh, we, me and Chris saw this film last Saturday, Sunday, actually. So it's been two, uh, two days, right? And I was so excited. I was like, oh my god, this was one of the funniest movies of 2023. It was one of the best oh, films we've seen this year. Yeah, it was fun. fun. So, Chris, go ahead. Um, I think you and I are kind of different about this film, um, but that's a good thing. You know? it's, it's a good contrast. But I'm, I'm, sorry. Of... I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no that's okay. I'm more in, like, the meshes about the film than the, the you know, like, the meshes of the film they're trying to say. But we'll get into that. Uh, but but we'll, what's your thoughts on the film? My bad. No, like, it, it was... No, no, you didn't do anything wrong. No, it was a, it was a good film, you know, just the, the silliness... The silliness of it, and um, you know the performances. The performances, most notably, you know, the musical sequences was amazing. The dancing sequences was amazing. Will Ferrell was, you know, absolutely uh, hilarious. You know, I thought he delivered the funniest lines. You know, at the at the right at the right times, and yeah, um, it really. Uh, it really did, and um, you know, definitely that little girl. She was that little girl. You know, she was definitely uh, fiery and um, delivered some scathing lines. I was like, "Ouch!" I was like, "Ooh, yeah, yeah." She pulled no punches <laughs> at all. Um, no. and, but I, I love how at the end of the day, she was able to rekindle her relationship with with the mom and. It definitely had its, you know, definitely emotionally moving moments as well. Especially yeah. when the mom of the weird world, she was just, yeah, you know, she was just going off on, you know, just the things that women face in society today. And I thought this movie um, mirrored mirrored the pressing issues we face in society today in regards to, you know, gender um, equality. Now, I know a lot of people saying, you know, some people are saying, you know, this is a perfect feminist movie and the movie's too feminist. Um, um that and that the movie's anti anti male. I would say the sequence in where the Barbies had the Kens like turn on each other so that, you know, the Barbies can like take back, you know, Barbie world take back um Barbie world. And and you know, before before that, you know, in Barbie world you know, it's basically this society that we live in today, but it's flipped, where the women are in the women are in power and the men just exist, but they are subjugated and they don't have like they don't have like the same rights the same rights as women do. And I'm like, okay, like that's not that isn't feminism at all. You know, feminism seeks, you know, equality and equal opportunities between men and women. You know, they don't seek a hierarchy where women are in power and men aren't <laughs> that's true um <laughs> well you know i will say uh they have very uh this movie tries to be very messy um if i'm saying yeah. that very messy kind of movie and uh, may, i will may, say may, some people may see it as a progressive movie kind of i would say yeah um, which is very impressive. I guess for me, I like the film because they did a good job of turtling that's like matches that they're trying to say, not and not offending the audience, which I'm kind of shocked about because this can easily offend the people. Like, and I'm with you, Chris, about certain things I, I don't like. Like, it's not venomous, as as we discussed last Sunday. When we were done watching the film, after the film was done, we, we kind of discussed a little bit about what, what they, they were trying to say. And I, I, I think there was like, I, I think there was certain plot storylines that they couldn't maybe develop more, but they just didn't have time to finish up. Like the whole like Kane thing was kind of underdeveloped, if you think about it. Like we kind of left it open ended. If they make a sequel, like I think it'd be kind of cool to have a Kane sequel. Like just just focus on Ken 
Kane as a character, and I, I think it can actually satisfy a conclusion to that like storyline. I so I, I wonder if they left that open ended because as it is, it's kind of unsatisfied because it's like oh they're like they made some progress, but they haven't, you know, after this like serious man war <laughs> they had in the film. Um, so, uh, but I will say it's one of the most fun movies we had this year. That was like, I, I think one of the issues this year, uh, I think people have was like, we got so many franchise sequels and, and like returning in this, in this years. And, and some, some of them were great. Um, but I think people are just dying for like original content and, and IP films. And so like Barbie and Opera were really satisfied that. And I, I think that's why Barbie hit so big this year mm -hmm. as the number one highest grossing film for 2023. I think it just, it, it, it had everything for people. It was like a, a very original idea. It's based on IP, but it hasn't been like done before, you know, Barbie movie. Um, you know, it, it has such a unique voice and, and visuals we ever seen before. Like, it was so cool that Derek, uh, Derek, Derek and her team did such a good job of Barbie Land to look like a toy, like right. land, you right. know, like 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 some of the Barbie like you know products that you've seen, like the girls and, and like the, the houses, like they, they nailed that. That was so incredible. So I I, I think the movie really excels on the on the visuals and and really the performances. I, I think this is one of the best performances. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm going to actually I wanted to um, read you a statement from a critic from the Daily Mail. So sure. here how this ahead. critic des describes the Barbie movie. It's a okay. deeply anti it's it's a deeply anti man move quote. It's a deeply anti man movie, an extension of all that TikTok feminism that paints any form of masculinity other than the most anod anodan as toxic and predatory. Every male character is either an idiot, a bigot, or a sad, rather pathetic loser. Do you, uh, unquote, do you agree with this uh, statement or disagree? I will disagree on the part that they're bigots and, and uh, was it the, the last part sad or something like that? Like, I... I, I think that the movie is showing if we have a society that had, you know, the females, the high, you know, the, the females were like in, in power and then the, the man was in the shoes of the females, then they feel what the, the females have been experiencing, you know? And I, I think the film handled that really well. Um, I don't like, I, I I think people have to understand that there was other things that the film was joking at and like mm -hmm. you're stabbing at like because like remember like the the like the CEOs and, and and Mattel like that is like real and I like that the film didn't shy away from that you know like it happened so like they they have in control of Barbie uh the the Barbie franchise like that and so. Like, and the reason they did it, you know, the, for the successful change, uh, it's like either for money or for image, you know? And I think that's the, the thing that is very true of these products and these brands, you know? It's always about the money, profits, or the image of the brand to be, like, not affected by negativity, uh, stuff like that, you know? Uh, but I disagree with the quote, like, because, like, despite... Like, 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 cause like, first off, like the CEO and, and like, and the whole man there are like, are predicted in the way that CEOs are. And then like Ken, you know, he, he's a good character. Like he's very smart. And like, uh, I, I think what he's doing makes a lot of sense because he is feeling un, under appreciated by Barbie. And so like, it's technically Barbie's fault that he, you know, when in this radical, you know, dictatory uh, uh, regime on Barbie Land, you know. Because well, yeah, know. yeah, because when I understand when you uh, mistreat a group for so long, when you like when you push someone, you know, they uh, 
they uh, pushed back. And yeah. when that scene where, where Barbie was crying in front of Ken and he was saying, you know, how does that feel? You know, it doesn't feel too good. Does it? Does it? Um, and I think that really speaks to that frustration and that, you know, alienation of that rejection he was feeling from, uh, you know, in the world of Barbie land. And, you know, that's yeah. what, unfortunately, you know, it's like that for real, but, you know, it's like that for women and for many men as well, when we don't, any man that doesn't follow, you know, the typical, you know, expected behaviors of men, the expected behaviors of men, and we have to be like, you know, stoic and tough and dominant and competitive. And there's a lot of men that are not like that at all. And a lot of those men get a lot of segmentation for not, you know, following those uh, tropes. Yeah. Well, and that's why I sort of like the commentary because they've been they're saying that for both parties. Like, look at uh, where Barbie is a good example of that. Like, we like we saw this like woman being persecuted because she is not like the, the stereotypical Barbies in the Barbie land. Mm -hmm. And like, even towards the end, they admit to that, and then they she accepted a job for Santa. Uh, what was it like? San Sen, um, Sen, uh, sanitary or something like that, or like it's something about health, uh, like clean, cleaning something. I don't know. I don't know. It, it was it was something that you know where Barbie just accepted it, and like uh, Alan, you know Alan, the the, the other can uh, Barbie doll that was played by Michael uh, 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 C uh, from Scott Friedman, like he he was sort of. Uh, but not persecuted, but like he was like being unnoticed by the other kids. Like he's not like like the other kids because of you know if you understand the Mattel history, like he was disaffected. You know he was disfunct, discontinued because he wasn't popular enough. So right. like we, you know, we're, we're we're discussing in both parties, and they isn't with different characters, not in our main characters. You know what I mean? Because our mm -hmm. main characters are dealing with something else, like the American. Foray and, and the star typical Barbie played by, you know, Mark Robbie, you know, they're dealing with external crisis they're, they're, they're facing. And, like, it's simultaneously. That's what they're talking about there. And that's the most consistent thing that they're really hitting, hitting home in this film. Where I think, for me, as I grow up, the other themes are there, but it's with different characters, and we don't spend enough time on them, you know, to really satisfy that discussion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I know what you, I know what you mean. You know, um, but I, I think it's there, and that's good. They, they're discussing it. But you know, if we get a sequel, I, I think you can develop a, that more in the sequel. You know. Yeah, I can I can sequel. That'll be nice. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be I'll be. Oh my god, I'll be so happy but to you. Other not, remember, this film had a pretty all star cast. I mean, you had Issa Rae. You had that woman that was in um. Was it Murder in the Orient Express? One of one of those films. Um, kind of far uh, Death, Death and Denial. Um, Emma, Emma Berkeley or something like that. Right. Uh, yes, Death on the Nile. I'm sorry. Um, and you had um, Michael Cera. You had um, Ben Kingsley. He's going to be playing Bob Marley in his upcoming bi uh, biopic. Uh, yeah. You see, of course, Ryan Gosling, Margaret Robbie, and you had Will. You had a uh, Will Ferrell. Um, you had that woman that played Weir Barbie. She's been on Saturday Night Live. Uh, Kate, um, McKinnon, Kate McKinnon. Um, yeah. So wow, like these two, these two movies that we're discussing had great casting. Yeah, they did. I, I mean, that's the thing. Oh, and don't forget Shang Wu, our our MCU Shang Chi. Yeah. Well, remember, uh, yeah. Well, we got a multiple Marvel actors here. Like as a uh, as a Ray was in Spider Man, uh, Kingsley Benier was in Secret Invasion recently, and then oh, Barcelona right. and and uh, Shang Shu, and then I'm trying to figure out. Um, oh well, then DC like John Cena from Peacemaker, you know Margot Robbie and you know Harley mm -hmm. Quinn, and then I I'm trying to figure out who, who's the other one. Uh, but yeah, a, a lot of major actors I recognize. Um. 
Uh, but, but yeah, uh, speaking of Weird Barbie, I think Weird Barbie was my favorite <laughs> like character. It was just so funny how she, she she was really like a weird character, like how she like moved her body like a mm-hmm. plastic dog you can do. And like hey, 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 what if, when we saw her again, it was so funny when Marjorie didn't recognize her and like it just had that image of the creepy messed up Barbie doll <laughs> in the <laughs> skirt. <laughs> Oh man, that was comedy gold. I, I just love that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Great ensemble cast. I mean, the casting was great here. I love Margaret Robbie as the Barbie here, the lead. Uh, she was great. She really like was really a star here, and like everything about you know ex- external prices and all that was really well done. And like it, it was like the heart of the themes that the film wanted to talk about, and I. That was nailed so perfectly by Murder Robbie's performance in the film. Um, I and, and, and of course Ryan Gosling was great. I, like he is like he. This is his my this is my uh, favorite oh, performance. I did not as, know as, that as, man could sing. He he has a voice. Yes, I, I think he's a musician. I I think I remember. I did not know that about him. Um, I thought. Yeah, you know, they must have rehearsed those uh, musical and dance sequences so many times because, like, it was so well put together and the choreography was just, um, it was on it was on point, dude. Um, I was just really surprised and really amazed at how amazing the musical sequences were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, oh my God, the musical was great. My favorite, like, okay, so the Dance, uh, dance the Night Way by... Dupa Libre, that's her name. Uh, the, the mermaid that we saw, uh, the mermaid lady, she's a singer, um, and she has a really great song. And, and thought the song in the par- uh, in Barbie's house party was really great. Mm-hmm. Like, that was very catchy. And uh, right. I, uh, I'm trying to make out what uh, I, the use of the 2001 Space Odyssey music was still great, but hilarious what they use it in the film twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was really great. Um, I tried to go. Uh, I should check uh, the soundtrack. Um, speaking of music career, yes, Ryan Gosling has a music career, and he he was also part of the Mickey uh, Mickey Mouse um, Club uh-huh. when he was a kid. Uh, he was there for 1993 and 1995. Right. And whoever was, well, actually, whoever was in charge of, like, the production design, you know, that person gets um, top-notch performance. You know, it accurately depicted uh, Bar- uh, Barbie Land, you know, really, really, really well. And, um, you know, the, cl- the cost- costume design, that was all on point. Oh, the costume design was really good. So whoever was in charge of that did a really great job. Yes. Oh, yes. They was awesome. Like, my favorite was the Ryan Gosling, like, fur coat he was wearing. That was, like, mm-hmm. great. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, everything looked, was, like, a Barbie dress that, like, could be, like, worn, which was great. Um, but, yeah, good point in reading up the, the costume. The costumes were really great. Um, I, I wish they we did something more fun in the real world. Like, that mm-hmm. was, it's always the thing with films they always deal with when you have a fascinating kind of world. And well, yeah. just... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, no, you were going to finish your point. I'm sorry for yeah, interrupting. Yeah. No, 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 very quickly. It, you know, like, 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 it, my criticism is like, I, you know, I get where we're going to the real world. I wish we did something more still, stylistically in the real world uh, instead of just like, like, just showing in real locations. Like, it, it, it's always kind of a trap to, like, see the real world. And, and stuff like that, and uh, like especially like like last action hero that uh, or so earlier like meta action film where we were mm-hmm. like in the fictional LA, but then when and him and the kid have to get out from the movie universe and get into the real world to stop the, the villains, like then mm-hmm. that movie just kind of lose some steam for me when we go to the real world. And that's my complaint about Barbie, but we don't stay too long for that in the movie. So thank you. Uh, but go ahead, Chris. What were you going to say? I think it was sound, sounded kind of important. Yeah, so, like, Barbie, it's pretty much used to convey a message to, like, female 
empowerment and it does through through like you know very comedic and emotional scenes so clearly Greta Thunberg I think her attention was for the film to have a positive message but also be fun at the same time and it was it had a lot of its uh funny moments and this film really centered on like the female uh, I guess like the female I I experience yeah 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 I agree um uh, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, especially like when we're into World War, like we still have fun. Like it was funny in the Mattel like building, like everyone was running in, in into like the, the workers like office, and like it was like a maze, which was kind of funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, it was like it was still fun. I, I'll, I'll say in, in the real world, like it was funny, uh, like how the Barbie and Ken was reacting to people. It was funny how they got arrested twice. That's was hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah, and plus, how they get bail? It's like that's another thing I was thinking about in the film. Like, how they let yeah, it never, like, yeah, it never. The film never really answers that answers that question, right? I, they, I mean, they like they didn't do anything bad, right? I mean, like they just you know, they, they hit. Oh, first off, I was like, why hitting someone? It's gonna be a thing to arrest. Like that doesn't make sense. And then the clothing, it makes a lot of sense to rest because we're stealing clothes. So, but it was funny that they didn't return the clothes to the owner. Like it was kind of funny. They kept it. So, so yeah, I, I don't know. But that that was that was really kind of weird. Um. Uh. Anyway, I will say. Um. So. So let, let's get into like Nick picks. So what what aspect of the family you didn't like? Because the, there is some problematic thing about Bart, and uh, we brought up the ending um, with the cans kind of like not like they they sort of have like like they got somewhat like a, a step forward in their lives a little bit. But not really. Well, like, like, not not re not really because it was basically in the end of the film everything was back to the way. Yeah. Everything was back to the way it was. Whereas, like again in Barbie Land, the women are on top and the men are, you know, at the bottom. I mean, Issa was willing to give him like a smaller like position in the Supreme Court, but like it was like the hierarchy was still there. So um, I'm not sure what the directors and. I, I, maybe the maybe you know Thumberg's intent was you know like this hierarchy and this gender inequality like it, it doesn't serve a purpose to anyone you know men 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 or women so you know I would say from that point the problem was really never was really never uh, solved and but I do uh, and uh, I do like that Barbie herself got an experience of what you know the real world was like. And and um, you know some of the so I guess like some lines were kind of like uh, like I wasn't really feeling some of some of the lines. You know I thought the writers could have had could have done the better job with, with the lines, but um, yeah. But definitely there were lines that were delivered like at the right moment at the right time. But um, yeah, there wasn't. There wasn't really any solution to the problems that the problem, the main overarching problem that it was conveying, which was, I would say, gender inequality. Yeah, I think that's the the major thing that was the. But then again, you can't film. expect to. Yeah, no, 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 no because like it, it, it's it's a very difficult balance to kind of achieve it satisfyingly, you know, in the film and to like get people behind it so the way that they, they sort of did it which i didn't like was like joke jokey about it like like they made a joke that you know of the cans not achieving no profits at all but it, like they they got to like the minimal wage of like having what, what, what was as a race character say that they got that that, that was like a compromise like i i, I can't remember it was like uh, something, something. It's like, give me a minute. 
uh, that's it's something I I can't remember that but it's it was something that that they say um yeah okay I did not say nothing in in the Wikipedia so I don't know what what was SRA's compromise to the cans but but it was it was something that was like low like low like a low job that you you're gonna get you're not gonna get a high position in the government really right mm -hmm. so like and, and it, it was play off as a joke and so mm -hmm. that was like not, not good so like uh yeah, like what would you expect you know you know i, I don't know it, it was very unsatisfied i always say please um uh, but one thing that they did very well, I would say, is like the like uh like the, like the expectations of the real world is not always true. Like nothing is always true. Like that is was very well done. Like Barbie thought that the Barbie did some good in the real world and like affected the kids, like the girl and being more miles. To take their dreams, and I really like that 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 was like was not true, and like it what Barbie did was just like create another horror problem that was true, you know, image um, shaming and like like ex like whatever uh, the daughters say, but like it, it was like very true, like body shaming or like uh, the stranger that like the greater the that Barbie has presented is not always true in real life, you know. Like, like that really worked in the film. I I would say, you know, like everything that Barbie is teaching is not really good, and I I, I kind of like that the film addressed that. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Um, so the film, uh, the film seems to be critical of like the patriarchy but um yeah. i think we just i think i wanted to ask you and discuss what that word really what that word really means because you know when when uh because like some people like kind of overuse that word and the word is you know loses meaning when it's not used in this proper context so you know yeah. what, what is the patri what is the patriarchy andre what what is that I mean, in the film with the Barbie Land, I mean, it well, it's kind of like similar to our world where you know the females are dominant species that have created the rules and the kind of government kind of society that they dispose and that the beliefs that they have, right? Where that's the part of the, the uh, what was the word? Uh, sorry again, uh, the uh, pa patriarchy patriarchy of that world but in the real world the patriarchy is buying the men they're the ones that they are running the the rules and like they set up the beliefs and so like that's something that we compare and contrast how each of the party is running like you know you got barbie there are you know are, you, you see how the females kind of run the party it's like it's very true they will do exactly what the men are are doing in the real world and like it's it's no secret like if if the male if the females are were the dominant species they will do exactly what the men is done it's just going to be a very different way uh, uh bless you uh sorry uh moving forward. yeah yeah so like i i feel like that's something that the movie is commenting on that both the site both sides are are actually the same, but they're not equal as like species, you know. And I think that's something that they nailed very perfectly in the film, you know. Because like, despite male females are different, they still have the same uh, intellectual thinking, but like they don't admit to that, you know what I mean? So like, like the Barbie Land are basically doing what the the the, the real world are doing. But like they don't admit to that, and that's the thing that like all societies don't admit is their mistakes and flaws as a working society. You know what I mean? All right. So, so let's 
So let's look at what patriarchy is. You know, it's important yeah. that, you know, we, we do our research and define these words. Okay. Patriarchy, a system, uh, not as a noun, a system of society or government in which the father or eldest male is the head of the family and descent and descent is traced through the male line a system okay. of site a system of society of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it or society or community organized on patriarchal lines okay. now so now we know what you know the paint now we know what patriarchy is now in greek yeah now patriarch yeah so the word the word patriarchy comes from the greek word patriarches which means the rule of the father it's used to describe okay. a social system where men have a disproportionate amount of power in social economic political and religious spheres in a patriarchal society, the most influential roles are reserved for men, and women are excluded from achieving parity with men. Okay, so now we know what okay. the patriarchy is, so we can use that word in its proper context, so that way, you know, it's not like hijacked or overused, or used yes. to mean something that it's not. Right, right. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 that's, that's it. That's all I... Oh, that's it. Right. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's displayed very well in the film. Like, you do see that in Barbie Land. Of, like, a very, like, integral, like, a very energetic side society and, you know, a very pitch-perfect kind of society. You know, uh, but underneath it is not really true. It's, just, like, a very, like, dystopian, like, very fascist way of you think about what the girl, the, the daughter saying, um, uh, her daughter's name, her escape is, uh, the, 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 the human world, uh, Sasha, that was her name. So the, the mm -hmm. daughter, Sasha, brought up fashion, which was kind of funny because he brought up, uh, what was it? We were bringing up the communist and fascism. This right. really dealt dealt it in the fashion way of how both society does it. Like, America does it differently in terms of the fascists, right? And then you've got Barbie Land, they're doing a different type of fascism, you know, but in a very gender way, you know? And I think they're, they're, they're like, this, this, like they're kind of disrespecting what's the meaning of fashion. If, if you see it in both, in both societies, but with different genders, you know what I mean? Like, you see the real world and how the man runs it, right? And then, and then you look at Barbie Land with the females, you see how it, it is in terms of fashion with females. I, I think right. that's something Barbie is, is really talking about and, like, showing the size of both worlds running by different genders, you know what I mean? And I think that's the one aspect that they do well. And, like, they do it in a very visually way. Like, because Barbie Land is this, like, you know, pink and very vibrant colors where you look at the real world it's vibrant but very weird you know colors you know and so and, and you see that and and how societies handle people's expectations and of uh, the accomplishments they do like how like they 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 get knowledge about their accomplishments like it, in a very satisfied or an unsatisfied way you know because that's just, like, yeah. like you know, Sasha's mom, like, is, is working in a very good job position, but, like, she's very unnoticed. And, like, the guy didn't, like, take, like, interest of the, 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 the images, the, the pictures she drew of Barbie, the, the external <laughs> crisis Barbie she was drawing that affected stereotypical Barbie in her world. And, like, it looked really good, as Sasha brought up later mm -hmm. in the film. So, like, yeah, I, I think they dealt with dealt in the, the the patriarchy uh of society in, in a very different uh, in, in in both sides of genders which right. i like so i think they did that very well yeah. it's just um like it, i think this movie is kind of honest it's like there's no compromise or like really progression 
in both sides, really, you know, it, it's not like the cans, like even the Mattel, like CEOs are still the same, like they yeah, haven't they, changed. Yeah, they haven't, you know I mean? nothing really, nothing really, nothing really changed. So the hierarchy yeah. never, the hierarchy never went away. So there was really no solution to like the conflict. Yeah, exactly. So that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the movie does a really good job of discussing those themes. Um, it's just like you have to, like, you know, bear with the film when they talk about those, like, very heated topics, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, I think now we can maybe step away with the, the heavy topics and talk about our, like, the film is funny. Like, I think that's the one thing I'm really impressed is how thoughtful the film is, but also how fun it is at the same time. And I think that's a really great thing about this film, is that it's such a great, fun film to watch. And when they nail the heavy things, it, it, it's really good. Like, like the Sasha's mom speech uh, in the film of, like, you know, not getting noticed. And, like, yeah, I, I just, you hear our audience was clapping when her speech was done. Like, that was a great, like, moment. Like, really. So, I, I, I really like Sasha's mom. And she was great. Um, and her speech was amazing. So I, absolutely, that uh, speech was um, moving, and I just think how you notice how in that scene there was no like music or any kind of sound effects because they really wanted they really wanted um, you know um, the girl the girl's uh, mom uh, to really like punch punch in with the issues that women that women face in society society, and I think that was really to get the viewer to understand what, you know, Thunberg was communicating in this movie. Yes, agreed. And and it's very true. And and at, at least he got awarded towards the end of thinking of a new type of art that Mattel can produce. So that was really neat. Yeah, and it's true. And I and, and think it, it, it inspired the stereotypical Barbie to head to the direction of being her own self. And I think that was pay off very well towards the end of the film. So I, I really like that. Um, I, I guess one thing that I do like is the jokes. Oh my God, the, what was the money gag of the Ken, the Ken memes, like, like I am Ken enough or Ken enough mm -hmm. or like Ken energy, sure. like all that really, <laughs> like really work. Oh my God. And the Ken song, I am King was really great. Oh my God. Like that, like that was so cool that they did that. Uh, uh yeah. Uh, what else? I am. Oh, uh, I wanted to say something here. Uh, I, I was drinking. So the husband that, that uh, America Flores' husband is in this film. That's actually yeah. her real husband, real life. I didn't know that. Well, that's actually her husband. husband. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And then one thing uh, I want to bring this up is the composer that did the film. Apparently, the song yeah. "I'm Just Kane" was largely a joke, and they recorded a demo for for Garrick, but it wasn't a serious thing to include the soundtrack. But apparently, she liked it. And so it became a theme in the film and, and, and right. uh, in the soundtrack. So that was really cool. And also uh, the film also was, um, as Issa Rae was saying in one of the interviews that, you know, the, the film was kind of like, you know, advocating, I'm paraphrasing for like, you know, like in Barbie land, you know, fantasy world, you know, everyone's, e everyone's equal, even though obviously there was a hierarchy there and that, you know, and that's free education, universal health care, free health care. So definitely yeah. there were a lot of uh, political undertones in this film. Yeah, that's very true. Um, which I do agree. Um, well, political well, undertones. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, which could happen, maybe, one day. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah, it, it, it's like, it, in the perfect word, that could be great to to be in the in, in that world, but you know, sadly, it's not true. 
But I appreciate that they added that because that is something what we need now in the world. Um, but yeah. Um, okay, so I, I like you brought that. Well, I mean, well, in uh, Barbie Land, been, technically, technically, if you again if you think about it, it wasn't an equal society in Barbie Land either. Oh no, 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 no! I mean, I mean, I like what was the Ken doing besides just like hitting on all the Barbies? <laughs> like, like. I, right, exactly. I, like they're just like they're just like there in the party or like in the beach. Oh, uh, what was that? Uh, what, what was Ken's running gag? Uh, like I'm a beach man or or what was it? Yeah, oh, um, he was. Uh, he he was just stand by and watch the beach. I'm a beach. I'm a beach man. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah, I'm a okay, beach okay. up, Ken. Ken or uh, <laughs> you know, beach off. Yeah, beach. Oh my god, the beach. Up. That was the most hilarious. <laughs> oh god. Oh god. Oh, it. Like, um. Oh my god, like. Oh, oh my god. That was so funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my god, the beach off. That was so funny. That, that was what my. Um. Yeah, oh, that was and, funny. Like, that was it, a scene in the movie. Yeah. Oh god. And. And then the cans not having weapons, but they have like toy weapons to to, to fight off. That's <laughs> right. They're fighting they're like in the whole world with toys. Yeah, and and then you see one of the acceptors get hit, and then they have like you know when you have your arm hit, like you have a cast or like a, a wrapping for your hand. Mm -hmm. You see the person having his hand have the the, the casting. I was like, what? You were hit by a toy? How do you get hit so hard? Like. <laughs> Oh my god, that was so funny. Oh, it was funny when we see like so many of the discontinued dolls in the Barbie universe, you know what I mean? Um, like the sugar daddy, the drill, like the one drill can, um, Alan, Alan as well, and then the planet Barbie, uh, which was a thing. And I was, that moment killed me when where Phil came out from that house and he saw the the print in Barbie and he's like, Oh my god, print in Barbie. I I, I thought I just continue you. <laughs> oh my god, that was funny. And then uh what was it? The T V Barbie? Uh like you saw the T V in her chest. Uh, or back yeah, then, I don't know what I think that was really funny. And of course the the uh how how how, how can I say this amicably? The, the the bosom Barbie, mm -hmm. uh, which inflated big, it was yeah. like, oh my god, I can't believe they did that. That was the most hilarious. <laughs> oh my god, that was funny. Um, I was trying to see the movie where um, the weird Barbie asks, like, you know, Margot Robert, Marco Robbie's Barbie is like, here, if you take this shoe, things go back to the way it was. You take this, you can discover the truth about the universe. And predictably speaking, Barbie's like, um, I'm gonna choose the first one, you know, back to the way it was. And she was like, Oh no, nope, yeah, we gotta do it again. Now. You have you have to wanna know. So then why would you give her so then why would you give her the option of choosing one if you knew you were gonna have her discover the universe anyway? But uh but yeah, definitely set the tone for the movie. I think that's particularly set the tone of for how the rest of the movie was gonna go. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. Um it, like well, that and then just the way uh, Barbie was handling Ken so many times in the film was like perfect way to understand what was going to be. So yeah, it was really great. Um, other jokes. Uh, what was the other gags that we liked? That was funny. Um, I uh, oh, I I try to think what was the funny one. Uh, it was funny that they're uh, every time they ha they were driving. They were seeing Son, and then the the car flips. That still was so funny. Still, mm -hmm. like when you saw Barbie, and then of course, like Kane was like he, he kind of like sneak in, and then of course the the real world um, uh, humans were driving, and then Alan was in the back. That was funny as well. Uh, that was very really, oh, have, of course Alan beating up the cult, the the was it the construction workers? Like out of nowhere, we get a fight. Of Alan versus this man, <laughs> and that was like three times his 
five. And, like, he was able to beat them, which was funny. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that was hilarious. Um, uh, let me check other trivia. Apparently, um, Margaret Robbie had two requests for the director. She went on a slide for her Barbie house. So, after she go to the bedroom, she can swim her pool. And then she requested for a mermaid Barbie to be featured in the film somehow which they apparently did um okay uh what else uh trying to figure out what other things we kind of seem to be um uh, oh uh so like if, if people were confused about la like here's interesting stuff with the barbie dolls that we've seen like as a race character is the you know president madam the president doll uh her famous was based on the 2004 part for the president African American version that had a red pencil. So, and apparently the Barbie for President is a Mattel doll line that first appeared in 1992. So that was intriguing. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, the font used in the film is based on the font that was used for all the Barbie dolls products and merchandise from 1975 through 1991. Because mm -hmm. the Bobby logo usually earn the goals and make over for each generation. Huh, that's that's interesting. Um Oh, uh so apparently the woman on the bench was played by the Oscar winning custom designer Anne Wolf, whose long and prolific career first started in the mid nineteen sixties. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that that was kinda interesting. That, that was fun. Um oh so uh okay so and then, and then of course the 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 opening scene uh of the film with the barbie um swimsuit that is something that is a recreation of the original 1959 barbie doll that was first debut in the stores that's like right. if you didn't know that like that's actually a thing uh uh what else uh, uh so and then this one is kind of funny so apparently, there's n there isn't a Pacific King that was a Asian variant, but apparently, a first Asian King doll was to be released in 2011. But oh, with, wow. yeah, apparently, with the co collector edition Japan King was shown in Samurai Can, it was clearly part of the Dolls of the World series. But not only was he was the first Asian King, he was also the first and so far only King. To be included in the Dolls of the World, which was previously a Barbie only line. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, uh, what else? I'm like looking through here. See any interesting? Um, oh, um, the actress. So this was funny. Uh, in the actress that played the the Barbie, Emma Mackey from from the de the the Death and Denial, her co-star, the the other Ken. That she was with is her co-star in the Netflix show Sex Education, and that okay. and that actor. Um, uh, let me get his name because this is a part. Um, uh, 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 the uh, Nika Geda, uh, if I'm saying that actor's name, um, he is going to be the new Doctor in the new Doctor Who series soon, okay. and. Yeah, and so and he's the co-star for her in their the, in the next show I mentioned, Sex Education, and they always pair them up uh, several times in the film. If you did, if you didn't know the background that I just mentioned, that they're co-stars from the Netflix show Sex Education, that was kind of cool that they did that to pair them. So that was really cool, and they they're good friends. So that was really neat. Uh, but, but yeah. So and then what else? Oh, I. So I want to bring up something. Uh, this is kind of cool. It, this movie has been in development since two thousand nine, uh, and and then we're gonna get, and then we can wrap up about Barbara Hammer, uh pop culture phenomenon that it became. So this film was in two thousand nine, right? In development. And do you know any specific details? Like who was the first actress that was gonna play Barbie before Margot Robbie? I mean, that, it's no, a little trivia. No, no um, to be honest, I really wasn't, I really didn't pay attention to um, the Barbie movie until my cousin and my cousin-in-law saw it. 
because they I was asking oh, yeah. questions. They were telling me about it. So that because of that, so because of those two, it uh, caught my interest. And I know you wanted to see it, see it as well. Yeah. And of course, I had heard you know criticisms that it was anti male. So I wanted to investigate and uh, see uh, see from see for myself. Um, but you know. It was. It was actually. You know, I wasn't expecting it to be as funny as it w as the way it was. You know, you know, I kind of thought yeah. it, it was just going to hit at like, you know, social issues and progressivism, which it did. But there was a lot of funny moments in it. So, um, so I'm glad that you know you wanted to see it and that I gave it a chance. And you know, it was funny. So I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed myself. But you know, as far as the backstory of the movie. Um, I just know, um, I don't really know about that. You know, I did do some background on Greta Thunberg and she does definitely has an interesting, uh, story and by, bi and, uh, biography. Um, and that, that also intrigued, that also intrigued me as well. And as well, so I just wanted to see, um, you know, what she put out and, um, I thought she put out a good product. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, is that the, the former CEO for Mattel, uh, if we're, we're discussing that? That created Barbie. Um, I, uh, cause you you brought up a person that I, I don't recognize. Um, uh, Greater Thunberg? No, no, I was, oh, yeah. I was just Greater Thunberg. Okay. I didn't, I didn't um, say, um, um, but, oh. um, yeah, uh, yeah, it was, so like, um, the, the person, uh, the, the Mattel former CEO that created Barbie. She has a very fascinating history. If we check it out, Chris, so, like she did die into legal troubles. <laughs> so I, that was very uh -huh. true in the film. Uh, and I was very happy this film actually addressed some of the scandal and like, like mistakes that Mattel did over the years. So I was very happy that they did that. And I was shocked that they were going to bring up the, the former CEO that started Mattel and the part of mine. That was so fascinating. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, so the, like, so the, the original actress that was going to be Barbie was Amy Schumer, uh, the other, to me, actress. Um, she was supposed to, uh, she joined the project after, I think, because uh, this was for jumping from studios, like in 2001, uh, 2009, sorry, let me make that really clear again. Um, in, uh, yeah, like, the development began in 2014 for a film. Uh, because 2009, Universal Pictures got the rights to do it, but then it got expired by 2013. 2014, Sony Pictures required the film rights, and then there's like a lot of multiple writer director changes with the casting of Amy Schumer for that. But then after that didn't go well, uh, later and halfway was supposed to be Barbie, and then it was around 2018, Warner Brothers got the rights, and then around there, 2019, Robbie was cast. So I just want to kind of bring that up. And apparently recently, Gail Gadot was supposed to be Barbie, but she had to turn down really? the schedule. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. That's Gal, Gal Gadot. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't really see her as Barbie. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I. It's yeah, so I thought dark. Marco Marco Robbie was the perfect fit. I thought she embodied that character perfectly. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that that I agree. So, um, and, and she looked like a like pretty Barbie, you know, like like she was the Barbie, like she is like a toy and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it's, so it's I, a I dolls and toys, you know. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Um. But, but yeah, so uh, I just want to bring that up. Um, plus, uh, to wrap things up, uh, you know, we're, we're a bit over two hours, but um, uh, Barbara Harmer. Uh, if anyone don't understand what I'm saying, Barbara Harmer, it's, it, it was this very funny, like, TikTok, like, like internet meme, because we got Barbie and Alpha Harmer releasing the same day. So, like, First, Christopher Nolan left Warner Brothers because of what happened with the, you know, HBO Max release day and all that. And so he wasn't happy the way they, they were doing that. So he left them and, and one, uh, Universal picked up the rights of Alpha Armor to be the next disappear for Nolan's film. 
to to fight and despite no one, Warner decided to release Barbie on the same day. So right. to just like yeah, you know, I don't know, despite no one for some reason. And so and then the internet just started to make jokes about the, these two films because it was just a weird combination of films. You got the light fantasy comedy film and then you got the dark and psychological like three hour epic film and, and, and then so, somehow it just became a pop culture thing and people were excited for that and then oh yeah it, 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 go ahead chris what were you gonna say oh yeah because um i those two films really hit at issues that we're facing today so they couldn't have come at a better time oh i mean that's very true uh uh i I was, I, I mean, for me, I, I think it was just people were very intrigued about these films. And I think in a lot of ways, the internet helped these films to be marketed so well that people went in and spent their monies. Uh, so like, like right now, like, uh, so Barbie became the number one highest grossing film of 2023. Uh, it actually out, outdone Super Mario Bros which was crazy, it became the highest grossing film in general for one verse. It beat Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows Part 2. That was their top part. So that was crazy. And then Opera Hammer, uh, recently, you know, I brought up the overtaken Guardian Strong and Tree in contest. It's actually the second highest grossing radar film of all time behind the Joker film. 2019. So it beat out The Matrix Reloaded and beat out the first two depth of films. So it was crazy. And this is also the number one film to not open at number one because it opened number two the day that they opened the first week. And that's still impressive. They still made money during the first week, but just not as number one. So I'm very impressed about this, like, pop, the up. The Barbara Harmer pop culture phenomenon that it became. Oh yeah, it was definitely a pop culture phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, and it's a rarely a thing that we see sometimes in, in our lives, Chris, which is crazy. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy it happened because, because uh, like, what was it June was kind of grim for films. Like it was like box box office bomb after box office bomb and disappointment, like. The Flash yeah. didn't do well. Had a rough time with with the uh, film, so I think uh, Barbie Heimer was a a rare plus for uh, summer movies. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and and I, I think it was good because like afterwards we started to get better films to perform. Like the Meg Two did well, the the Team Ant did well, um, which was good, and uh, well, except for Blue Beetle, Blue Beetle was not doing well, not doing well, whatever. Um, but yeah, so it, it was it was really crazy time. It, it and also like the people that were like the movies that were close to Bob Humber were really affected by that. Like Mission Impossible Seven was affected by this badly because of the amount the amount of IMAX the uh, screens they needed because Opera Humber had full control of that for the next three weeks. And I heard Tom Cruise was upset about that. And likely so, because unfortunately that movie didn't do too well in the box office, unfortunately, which is sad. Uh, great film uh, from MI7. And then another constancy that no one cares about, I don't care about this, but Haunted Mansion. Who in the right mind released Haunted Mansion in a July? It was just so dumb by Disney. And yeah, they should have stuck with the August, uh, whatever. So. Um, any last things to say about Barbie, uh, uh, Chris? Um, I think that film along with Oppenheimer were the highlights of uh, this summer. But I'm looking ahead now to uh, 2024. Um, <laughs> I can't see what 2024 has in store for mo for uh, movies. And okay. um, yeah, that's about that's about it but yeah i enjoyed um barbie and i enjoyed oppenheimer and you know as i was saying i thought barbie was a pop culture phenomenon and it was very uh you know you know if you want to classify it as a progressive movie i, I would say so too since it hit a, a lot of like 
feminist themes, but, you know, it was silly and funny at the same time. Yeah, I agree. Um, I like these both movies. I'm happy we discussed this first. Um, before we will discuss the other two movies that we'll announce soon. Um, but, but yeah, it was, a, it was a great time. I'm very happy we got a chance to see Barbie. Uh, we saw Barbie Robert a long time ago, but it's great to talk about that again. Excuse me. Uh, but for for next podcast, uh, for audience uh, to know what was our next step, so me and Chris will be back to discuss uh, Kimi MT and MI7 because uh, we saw the films, uh, you know, long time ago, and that will be our next uh, podcast uh, later date. So uh, I'm not announce how many weeks, but yeah, it'll be our next dis- discussion topic because we really love uh, Mission Impossible Seven: Dead Reckoning Part One. Uh, we really love the Ninja Turtles, uh, Meet and Mayhem. I, I had the chance to sell it twice, which I was very happy. And same thing with MI7. Uh, Chris, you had a chance to rewatch uh, Meet and Mayhem, like, the second time, or just that one time that we saw with Chris? No, I, I, no that was just uh, just the one time. Okay, but that's fine. I mean, I, I we, we only saw once Barbie and I so. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so I, I, I saw it twice. Uh, you know, I my, my cousins were here, so I, I had just saw uh, me and Mayhem in, uh, late in August. And MI7, I saw the second time with you because you didn't have a chance to see it uh, mm-hmm. in July. Like, that was like the thing. So, but yeah, but thank you, Chris, for joining thank me. You. I was so happy we, we, we discussed uh, another movie that does discuss for Ben Dreyer's Paul Culture Talk. Um, I'm very happy you got your job. Um, that thank, you, thank you. And, yeah, uh, so Thank you, uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm glad uh, we had this uh, discussion. I'm looking forward yeah. to our uh, next one. Um, yep. And I also, and you know, I also saw Blue Beetle. I really liked that film. I really liked how um, mm. it really, yes, it really um, represented Latino culture very, very well. Um, mm-hmm. I was not, besides uh, Zolo Mari, Mari Duena, I wasn't familiar with the other actors. And, um, you know, and also George Lopez. I mean, I know George Lopez, but um, George Lopez yeah, brought comedic relief. And the villain, Carplax, um, you know, I knew him from uh, Apocalypto and Susan Sarandon. Uh, you know, she did a really good job as uh, Ted Kord's sister, who was also a Blue Beetle, uh, being a, being a, a villain. And um, and uh, we'll see what uh, the rest of 2023 brings with films, but I'm also looking forward to next year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah 20 reading of 2024. Are you saying that because of Doom Part Two just got moved? <laughs> uh, you know, yes. Yep. All yep. right. Yeah, yep. I knew it because I had a feeling like, why are you reading up 2024? And I'm like, oh yeah, it has to be Doom Part Two. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, and plus, you know, once all the DC films came and went, you know, I was like, all right, it's time to move on to next year. <laughs> oh my god, that is so funny. Buddy, like, we got our movies, like, the Marvels is coming in November, hopefully. Uh, we got the Blanca show, like, movie, and uh, Aquaman 2. Uh, we're getting a trailer for that soon, four days. Apparently they say. Yeah. But the thing is, like, so I'm working at the movie theaters now, and, you know, I may, like, oh. actually see it. Yeah, so, the excitement won't be, won't be the same, so I'm, uh, but, um, yeah, I'm just, uh, excited for this year, for the rest of this year, for, uh, um, next films, and, um, you know, um, I would have loved to see Dune if it had come out this year, but, you know, unfortunately, things happen. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. I mean, damn you, by your strikes. But hey, that's the, the studio's fault. They need to pay their actors and writers. That's the thing. I mean, they do. Yep. Absolutely. Oh. I agree. Yeah. Well, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on that note. Please, folks, support uh, the writers and the actors on the strike very important uh, uh for now uh thank you for everyone to listen to this podcast me and chris will be back soon uh for another podcast on the various book culture talk on the team and t meal mayhem movie and with 
uh, with the double uh, double film with Mr. Impossible Sun and Dead Great Thing Part 1. So thank you everyone. Have a good night. Uh, have a good week. And we'll be back soon.